is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon. Always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. Welcome to it. Six minutes after the hour here on this Tuesday. It's the Steve Gruber Show. You can get a hold of us here at 888-900-9966. 888 is the hotline number. This is part of the program brought to you by Mesa. Good health, good business, and great schools. Mesa bringing you this part of the Steve Gruber Show. Um, got a couple of uh, folks in the studio that will be here on the air in a moment, but got to talking in the break about... You know, Consumers Energy is going to shut down these seven power plants. Two more being shut down by uh, DTE, nine total. And it's not just Michigan that's shutting down coal-fired power plants. That's happening all over the country. The problem is that Michigan is more dependent on coal-fired power plants than other places around the country. Other states are not as dependent as Michigan is, which creates a, well, it's a bigger problem for us. And when you hear the VP of Consumers Energy come out and say, listen, guys, we're going to have rolling blackouts and the prices are going to go through the roof. Um. That's where we run into crisis, and, uh, you know, those are the conversations we're having. How can it be the new normal in America? How can it be the new normal in America that we have rolling blackouts and people don't have enough electricity? And as, and as Ivy and I were talking about here earlier, my God, our, our, the electric bill, now, now they've made some corrections on it. It was over $500. We, we don't live in that big of a house. I mean, it's it's decent, but come on, it's, it's an average house. Um. And when your electric bill is already $500, so if the new normal, I'm going to say this, if the new normal is sitting in the dark because you have rolling blackouts, but you're sitting in the dark with a candle looking at a $500 electric bill, you know, that might fire people up. <laughs> you know, that I'd might say. be that might be what finally gets their attention, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I'd say. Absolutely. I mean, and then if, there's a, if the no- rolling blackouts are regular, and I mean, all these policymakers, well, hey, guys, you told us to do this. Now there's... Unreliable energy all over the country. Well, there isn't enough. There's a problem. The, the, the grid is, is, is strained, especially. Yeah, you know, we, we had, I think, two days over 90 degrees this year in Michigan, one day last year that I remember. So we've had pretty mild summers overall, despite the, um, the doom and gloom and the global warmists and so forth. It's been pretty mild here in Michigan. The, the biggest strain on electricity comes during heat waves. Mm-hmm. I mean, when people are all running their air conditioners and so forth, heat waves are what stress out uh, the grid. So not only will you have rolling blackouts, you'll have sweltering heat. And then we go, oh, my God, it's global warming. No, you idiots. You turned off the power. You turned off the power. I mean, what would, what would the southern United States be without air conditioning? It'd be a wasteland. Wouldn't it? I mean, who, 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 <laughs> the hell would want to live in, who the hell would want to live in Mississippi without air conditioning? I mean, I don't know who wants to live there now. But who would want to live there normally without <laughs> air conditioning? I mean, you think about So you think about the fact that they're going to put us into this position intentionally. And here in America... Uh, with the Green River Formation, a very simple example of, of what's in Colorado and Utah, there's 3.5 trillion known barrels of recoverable oil there. Uh, we have the the oil that was found by Chevron in the Gulf of Mexico, the oil that was found on the North Slope in Alaska by, um, was that Shell, I guess, recently? The point being is America is very blessed in, in, in natural resources. We have more coal, more oil, more natural gas, more timber, more valuable farmland, than any piece of real estate in the world. And yet we intentionally are, are, are hobbling ourselves. And for what reason? I, I can't tell you. Except that if you go back all the way to the 1920s and certainly to 1970, you can find a list of predictions about the world and how we're all going to go to pieces and the world's going to end. Why? Because America uses too much. Well, America's only 5% of the world population. They use, you know, 55% of the world's oil. And so what? We also put a man on the moon, created better uh, communications, better medications, better, you know, uh, systems around the world through free market and the free markets, uh, you know, free trade. Capitalism has, has lifted more people out of poverty than any single thing in the history of mankind. And it's, it's the way it is. It's, it's indisputable. You know, Stalin, you know, 
uh, stop feeding a lot of hungry people. We could, well, he had 50 million die. He didn't have to feed as many as there's 50 million of them dead. Mao got 100 million through his socialist campaign. And yet we have this romanticism today. We being not me, but some people in the country with Bernie Sanders and socialism. Uh, this, this romanticism is, is, is it's pure foolishness. I mean, people have smartphones, but do they have books? Can they read? Can they do a little bit of history, you know, and study what's really going on in the world? And apparently not. So a while back, I wrote a, a column, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, about things that I will think will be gone in 50 years if we don't get it together right now. And things that I think will be gone in 50 years, the right to keep and bear arms gone. In fact, in California right now, they're doing a movement to uh, to tax ammunition with and, and to tax ammunition to have an instant background check for for all the ammunition you buy, which is the next logical step for the anti-gun movement. Um, the freedom of speech in 2065 will be very different than it is today because you won't be allowed to offend anybody ever. You know, you can't say, I mean, as it is today, you can't offend anybody for God's sake. The freedom of speech, yeah, but, you know, don't say this and don't wear an American flag. You know, it's Cinco de Mayo, you know, don't wear that American flag t-shirt to school. It's an American high school. Yeah, but you might offend the kids that are from Mexico. Excuse me? Um... ATMs, of course, will be gone. So will paper money, probably. I mean, let's be honest. Paper money is not going to be around. Um, and, and as I got down the list, I see that, you know, the days of, let's be honest, what's the coolest thing when you when you get to be 16? It's when you have your driver's license. And good God. You and your buddies, you're out cruising the back roads. And never mind what we did out there. I mean, it's not important. <laughs> the point is, we're out cruising the back roads, uh, being boys, right? It's called freedom. Route 66 and all that happiness. American freedom. Well, make no mistake, these uh, pilotless cars you have running around with the name Google on the side in Ann Arbor and elsewhere, that's the beginning of the end for freedom when it comes to transportation. Because how dare you have a car, you know, that uses fossil fuels? You're going to destroy the planet, you know? Who do, who do you think you are going for a Sunday drive? You know, what's wrong with you trying to destroy the world? Uh, private property rights will go right along with that. Cigarettes will be gone, uh, but they'll be replaced by dope. Hmm. Yeah. You know, why? Why is that? All right, boys. Tell me that. Why is it okay to smoke weed and cigarettes are the you know and they're gonna be banned everywhere? It's just a matter of the way it is. Uh, cows will be gone. You won't be eating steak for dinner. You know, cows have gas. Ivy, do you know that? They they have Lots flatulate. Of it. You know, and apparently that's <laughs> destroying the planet too. Flatulence from agriculture. Because we can't have any cows anymore. Global Steve. warming. You know. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Backyard chickens, those will be gone because the government, the USDA through regulation wants to control everything you do. The means of production controlled by the state. They'll do it under the guise like uh, we have some chickens for people that don't know. We have a, we're chicken ranchers. We're kind of mm -hmm. proud of it. Uh, so we're, we're chicken ranchers and uh, we have a few chickens. But the government wants to make sure that nobody gets sick. So every chicken you have, this is true. The USDA came up with this idea a couple of years ago or I don't know if they came up with it, put it out there. If you have a, uh, some sort of, um, livestock, which the chicken qualifies now, uh, it all has to be registered with the state of the federal government. So our chickens have to be registered at some point going forward. And why do you think that is? Because then comes through, you know, there's somebody, some woman got sick 100 miles from here, so we have to destroy all the chickens. Therefore, see, they control all the means of production. Chairman Mao would be proud, wouldn't he? Anyhow. Yes, food for thought on a, on a Tuesday. Uh, uh, government food for thought. 14 after on the Steve Gerber Show. Delivering Michigan's common sense with a big dose of truth and honesty. It's 18 after the hour on this Tuesday. You know, the Democrats set a record of 15.8 million viewers on CNN here at their debate. Um, I don't know if they counted me for the three and a half minutes I was watching, but they, they must have. All right, I watched more than that, but not much. Ivy gave me the, you know, the eye roll about 10 minutes into it. <clears throat> I said, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, it's pretty, it's pretty boring. And I didn't get much out of it. Um, but our good friend Liz P, columnist for Fox News and the Fiscal Times, uh, uh, had a chance to watch. And, and Liz, I, I understand you think that Hillary stood abo above the rest of the midgets. Um, now, now, I say that kind of, and I say that kind of uh, humorously because, you know, back in, was it uh, the summer of 1992, was it Time Magazine? that had the Democratic candidates on the cover that said the seven dwarfs and Bill Clinton was one of those folks? <laughs> well, it's a reasonable analogy, right? We had, we definitely had half 
think that was Lincoln Chafee. And then there's Grumpy. We know who that one is. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, look, I mean, I think Hillary did stand out. Uh, She certainly seemed to be the most poised, capable, seasoned, uh, articulate of the five. Uh, and and yet, interestingly, as you probably know, the focus group that followed right away, Bernie Sanders actually was the one got the feel the burn. Turns Bernie out Sanders. that Hillary Clinton really didn't add to her lead uh, by her debate performance. Mm-hmm. But I think that's because it, it, she came across as I think the grown up in the room. But that doesn't really change the fact that most voters don't trust her and that she has an enormous number of issues out there. And, you know, Democrats can do all the spinning they want on this Benghazi hearing. And, indeed, she may survive this hearing intact and without making the kind of terrible mistake that she did the last time when she said, what difference does it make anyway? Yeah, yeah, and that's going to end up in a... But that doesn't mean that Benghazi committee is not holding hearings on something that was really important and i think hillary clinton's problem is bigger seven, though i think hillary clinton's problem is bigger in that the people i mean frankly people don't like her it's not just yeah. that, that people don't trust her uh people didn't trust her husband but they liked him <clears throat> you know they certainly didn't trust their daughters with her husband but they liked him well enough that they'd have a beer with, uh, i'm sorry did i say that uh, but they, but, <laughs> I, think you know, I think you're totally right they don't like hillary and again even though she looked like a pro, which she is on that stage, that doesn't change the fact that <clears throat> that she's not particularly likable. I totally agree with you. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay, so the Washington Post, uh, I see um, they got a little ahead of themselves. Uh, Dewey defeats Truman, and, and the WAPO put out a, a, a published a story announcing Joe Biden's candidacy before they yanked it right Sorry? back down this morning. Yeah, for real. Uh, it was a, it was a um, excuse me. What's that, Liz? I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You're cutting out a little bit. I said the Washington Post published a story this morning um, and then yanked it right back down with uh, a headline announcing Joe Biden getting into the campaign. Maybe they know something we don't. It was a uh, it was a draft piece uh, dated uh, huh. the 19th of October, written by Paul Kane, and some of the pieces had X's where they were going to fill in certain bits of information, but it's all there. And the Biden uh, announcing his presidential campaign published by the Washington Post long enough for the Republicans to send it off to their war room. Uh, So, I mean, Biden's getting in this thing, don't you think? I think he is. There were two or three uh, pretty thinner. All right. Okay. Hold on a second. Morning. Hold on a second. Pretty hilarious. We're having a little issue there with the phone line. Let's let's reconnect that real quick. We'll get that fixed, Alex. Go ahead and that's a couple of times. I don't know what's going on with the phone line there, but this uh, Washington Post line is just bothering me. The Washington Post um, article here, uh, they are very embarrassed. The editors there, they left scrambling because uh, what it was, it was an accidentally published article declaring that Joe Biden's candidacy for president had been um, uh, begun. And there were X's showing in certain areas where details were yet to be added. For example, Vice President Joe Biden plans to enter the contest for the 2016 presidential nomination, ending months of speculation about his intentions and delivering a jolt to an already unpredictable contest, according to blank sources familiar with the decision. And um, uh, so uh, anyhow, so the Washington Post gets out there in front of it. Anyhow, Liz, back. uh, Sorry about that little problem there. But uh, you believe he's going to get in the race. I believe for some time he's going to get in the race. And I believe if he does get in, because Hillary is unlikable, and Joe Biden, whether he's competent or not is another question, but he's likable, I guess. Well, I think it's interesting, too, that Hillary, uh, during the debate, made no um, secret of the fact that she is running on four more years of, of Obama, basically. And no one can do that better than Joe Biden. If he comes into the race, people are now, it's so funny, that impatience uh, for uh, on the part of many pundits and stuff for his declaration has taken now sort of a negative turn, and they're sort of like, okay, enough already, let's do it. Okay, so he's got his own timetable, but if he comes in the race, and if he gets the backing of President Obama, that is very powerful. Obama is still the best uh, leader in the Democrat Party. You and I may not think he's got a lot to be excited about or voters excited about, but the truth is, The Obama coalition is essential to electing whatever Democrat wins, and it looks like he will be backing Joe Biden. So if Joe gets in the race, he's going to have a lot of uh, ammunition on his side. Well, And it doesn't really matter if if, uh, uh, President Obama, as long as Valerie Jarrett 
Yeah. I'm supporting Joe Biden, as we well, <laughs> well know. Yeah, and, and she is. Uh, let's, let's, let's be honest. It's no secret in Washington. Valerie Jarrett has little use, if any, for Hillary Clinton. Oh, there's a lot of animus there. I think that's totally right. Um, and and look, I mean, Hillary's got <laughs> Hillary's got a lot of problems, and I think she's very vulnerable, not only to Joe Biden, but by the way, to any Republican uh, who is finally nominated, whoever that turns out to be. Uh, and President Obama knows that. I think he's very worried that Hillary is beatable, and he would like to see Joe Biden take a run for it. By the way, why wouldn't Joe Biden get in the race? Yes, it's exhausting, and he's got all kinds of work to do to establish a, uh, the architecture of a campaign. But don't forget that all of Obama's apparatchiks are still kind of, you know, waiting around and kind of haven't really attached themselves to Hillary. Uh, so I think it's quite possible that Joe Biden is in and up and running very quickly, I'd say within two months. No, uh, they say, well, the Washington Post said within 24 hours. Oh, I mean, he'll declare, but in terms <laughs> of actually having a field operation. I got you. Liz Peek, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Sorry about the phone problem. Oh, that's that's no problem. <laughs> okay. Liz Peek from Fox News, right here on the Steve Gruber Show. We'll be right back. Taking a closer look at the stories that affect you most with a big dose of common sense. All right, it's 33 after the hour. It's the Steve Gerber Show, the Common Sense Hotline. If you have any questions about um, anything we do here, 888 900 We encourage your conversation, your input, uh, because I think we make, it makes the show, it, when you get involved, it makes the show bigger and better and, and better for all of us. Uh, as we've been talking about this morning, autism is something that affects millions of people. Uh, around the country, certainly right here in Michigan, people affected every day. And the question is, you know, uh, what do you do uh, when you need help? When, when you're out there and you're looking for some place that can give you a helping hand, let's be honest, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work to have an autistic child in your home to begin with or an autistic adult. It takes a lot of dedication, a lot of work. Joining me this morning, Scott Berry, the CEO of Century of Healthcare uh, and autism services, something that you guys offer and something you guys work with. Um, all the time. And welcome to the program. Good morning, Steve. Thanks so much for having me on. I mean, obviously, uh, you, you see it firsthand. Autism affects families. It affects communities. It affects people, you know, and, and, and you know, people want to, you know, do everything they can, but it is a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the most recent statistics uh, published by the CDC say that one in 68 children will be diagnosed with autism. And so awareness of the disorder is really growing. Uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about it, but what we really see is that people need help, as you're saying. And the state of Michigan uh, in the last two years has enacted some legislation mandating coverage for services for children under the age of 18, uh, which are covered by private insurance, non-ERISA-based policies to be able to get a very specific type of therapy called applied behavior analysis or ABA therapy, mm -hmm. which is the only evidence-based practice shown to produce significant results for children with autism in communication, socialization, reducing difficult behaviors, and just overall preparing them to do well in school uh, build strong relationships with their family and with friends, and then do well into the future. And is it anybody who's um, paid attention to autism uh, much at all would know there's a spectrum. Um, there's a, I guess, a level of severity, if you will. Uh, for me, being a layman, I don't have anybody in my family that is autistic. Like I said, I have friends, and so I'm, I'm like just about everybody. I know somebody who is affected either directly or indirectly by autism. And I'm going to make a, an assumption here, but you correct me if I'm wrong, that this uh, applied behavior analysis has to do with how well the individual functions on that, on that spectrum, if you will. And then um, therapies are directed to their specific needs. Yes, that's absolutely right. I'm a board-certified behavior analyst actually assesses each child that we work with and develops a specific intervention plan for them uh, that targets things that they want to work on. Uh, it really focuses on things that are uh, going to be socially significant. And so that basically means we don't, you know, we don't want to just work on some simple task because, you know, that's it. We want to work on things that the children themselves will get value out of. You know, so as they get older, those goals change. Uh, they might become more geared towards socialization, making friends, being able to communicate, being able to do well in school. Sure. With the ultimate goal impacting uh, impacting 
people and their independence down the road. Uh, one statistic that was published was that 88% of adults um, are unable to financially support themselves, uh, 88% of adults with autism. And, you know, that's something that really you need to start working on early on uh, with these children uh, when they're school age and even uh, prior to being school age, so that uh, one year old all the way up to age 18. Right. And, you know, with people living longer, that means that there have to be resources available, um, not only for, you know, those with autism under 18, but those that live out there their entire lives with different needs. I mean, let's be honest. You mentioned the word independence. Um, some of these folks uh, will be able to find some degree of independence, but some will never have that depending on their functionality. Right. I mean, depending on where they are on the spectrum, if if they're low functioning, uh, which I think is the proper term that I've heard, if they're lower functioning, they may need uh, supervised care for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's it's a big undertaking. Yeah, that definitely is potentially true. Um, you know, we've heard that it's estimated that direct care costs for an individual with autism can be $3 million over the course of their lifetime. Hmm. Uh, but what we're also seeing is that a lot of kids that are getting this therapy, especially early on, and, and really early intervention is the key, uh, statistically speaking, uh, that that can be, you know, dramatically reduced over the course of their lifetime. So hopefully, I, I so what you're pointing for, and we're on with Scott Berry, the CEO of Centria Healthcare, and talking about autism services um, for the, the one in 68 kids diagnosed now with, with autism, is how to make them, I guess what, what, what your goal is to lower that 88% uh, level of, of uh, people with autism that cannot support themselves. And every time you can take a percentage point off there, it means more independence, more freedom, more people out That's there correct. living a life and not being institutionalized, as they used to say. Yeah, absolutely. You know, really what we want to tell people is that the key uh, as much as possible is to get children into services as soon as they can. Uh, so early intervention and early uh, diagnosis is very critical for that. Uh, children can be diagnosed uh, with autism with a very high degree of success as young as age 18 months. Uh, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends uh, screening for autism at 18-month and 24-month wellness visits for all children. Uh, because if there is something going on, you really want to get help as quickly as possible because you dramatically change the trajectory for those children in their development by getting them into services. Well, I guess and, here's the question then, I, I, I guess, what should people be looking for? I mean, uh, uh, diagnose, diagnosing is important, but um, what are some of the, the things that people should be looking for? Say, listen, maybe I need to, you know, contact my health professional. Maybe I need to talk to somebody at a place like Century. Who do I talk to? What do I look for to say, listen, um, I've got some challenges in front of me for me and my child and my family. Yeah, well, I th you know, I think every parent asks that question, uh, you know, really from the day their child is born, they want to make sure that they're uh, progressing according to the norm and, you know, is everything going all, all right? And so, you know, what you should look for is just signs that your child might not be keeping track with some of the uh, different developmental milestones, um, you know, cooing, uh, engaging behavior, eye contact, uh, interacting with others, interacting with toys, maybe withdrawing back from progress that they've made. Yeah, you know, And there's really a whole list of things to look for. But the best thing to do uh, would be to uh, go through a questionnaire called the MCHAT, which is the Modified Check for Autism in Toddlers. And that's something that we make available and is also available on our website, which is www.checkforautism.com. Uh, or people can call us and we can send that out to them, as well as a guide of how to access services. Uh, and that's one of the best ways to, you know, spot a sign of a developmental delay early on and then just talking with your pediatrician. I think one of the things that um, you can't put a, you know, uh, a, a, you can't pinpoint a, a gut feeling from a parent. If a parent thinks, you know, trust your gut. You know, if you think Absolutely. something's not quite right, then, you know, see somebody and, 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 and get started. Because like you're saying here, uh, the earlier you get a jump on this thing, the better chance that child has of having a more fulfilling life and not being among the 88% that need, you know, care for the rest of their life or can't support themselves because obviously we want to change those statistics. That's um, right. Scott, I greatly appreciate it. Scott, very CEO of Century of Healthcare. I, I appreciate you coming in today. Again, that, that website. Yep. It's uh, www.checkforautism.com or we can also be reached by phone at 855-77-AUTISM. 
and you can speak directly to one of our autism services experts. All right. Good show, and uh, and you're doing good work out there. Check for autism.com. Uh, we'll put that up on the website and on the uh, Facebook page as well. Check for autism.com. If you, if you wonder, what does it hurt to check, right? What does it hurt to ask the question? It's Tuesday on the Steve Gruber Show. Thank you to Scott Berry. We'll be right back. Thank you. Michigan, born and raised with Midwestern values and Michigan common sense. You know, you've probably heard this story that we were talking about. Um, this Dr. Michael Roth, who apparently had containers of dismembered fetuses in his trunk. I mean, uh, seriously, how, how do we get to a point? Now, this is uh, an outspoken OBGYN here in Michigan who has said he believes in abortion. He says he, he, he thinks that abortion should be available on demand. I've never turned anybody down. No, apparently not. And apparently uh, the, the attorney general thinks he might actually be doing abortions illegally in his home. Uh, well, what a class act. Um, joining me now, State Senator uh, uh, Pavlov is here with us today um, to talk more about this. Senator, welcome to the program. Steve, how are you? I'm doing well, sir. Hi, I mean, I saw this story, sir, and I'm just like, I, I, we talked about this yesterday, and I'm just like, how do we get to a point <laughs> uh, where this is in the newspaper, that this guy, who's an outspoken, you know, pro-abortion guy, is out there with, with the jars of fetuses or pieces and parts in his trunk. I mean, it, it makes me sick to my stomach. Well, it should, and I think that there's a collective uh, just... It, it, this country has been gripped by not only the Planned Parenthood videos of the atrocities that are happening to the unborn child um, and the financial benefit from it. I mean, literally, it, we've, we've always thought that this was going on. We now have proof, and Michigan is stepping up right now with the, with the new bill that I introduced to make it illegal to sell any of these fetal tissues or baby parts. And uh, we'll put you in prison for five years if you're caught doing it. Well, here, yeah, here's the thing. You know, in survey after survey, the vast majority of Americans, even pro-choice Americans, do not believe that abortions should be performed after the first trimester. They, they, they Rape, incest, they don't care. 88% of Americans believe that after the first trimester, that should be it. Now, I've asked the Democratic chair here, the new Democratic chair here in Michigan, uh, when they believe that abortion, you know, should be uh, cut off, when it should no longer be allowed. Won't answer the question, of course. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the National Democratic Chair, won't answer the question. Uh, and in fact, in the uh, the Democratic platform for their party every four years, uh, available on demand at any time, you know, third trimester abortions, they think should be uh, okay. Not, not, the rest of us don't think that way. And why isn't it time for Michigan, even for pro-choice people, to say, okay, we can cut it off at least after 12 weeks? After 12 weeks, we can say, that's enough. It has to end there. Why don't we just go ahead and do that? Well, look, in my mind, it shouldn't happen at all. And the unborn is the unborn, and that is the life. And those are the things that we work hard to protect in this state. Uh, they can nuance this conversation all they want and put time frames and when it's acceptable. Um, but I think that the mood is turning in this country. And uh, how we ever got away from protecting the sanctity of life and somehow, you know, made it acceptable that 55 or 60 million of these babies have been aborted. That somehow our society is, is viewed as that being acceptable. And, uh, you know, as horrifying as those Planned Parenthood videos were, I think that they were very instructive. And there's a lot of motivation among the, the pro-life community, um, particularly in the thumb where I represent, Say, look, this is our opportunity to put an end to this all together because it, it, it's just the visuals are so horrific. When you're literally talking about modifying a procedure in order to harvest a particular baby part uh, and then negotiating a price for that baby part, oh my God. how far has society fell? A, a long way. Well, the other procedure we were talking about here on the program this week uh, over the last couple of days, dilate and evacuate, I think is what it was called, dilation and evacuation, right? Um, and, and this is for, you know, a second trimester and beyond fetuses uh, where I come from, we call them babies, but you know, so it is, I'm old fashioned, yeah. I'm old fashioned that way, Phil. So, so accept my apology, well, we, but we appreciate that old fashioned value because that's where America's heart belongs. Uh, you know, and, and so I guess 
I think it's time to step up and, and go further. Why don't we have uh, bills out there that say, you know, if you're going to dilation and evacuation, you're taking a, a, a child out of the womb. I mean, let's just call it for what it is. You know, in, in, in uh, you know, up to 12 weeks, okay, we can debate that going forward. But wouldn't it be proper, at least, to say that 88% of Americans, including those that are pro-choice, believe that no abortion should occur after the first trimester, and maybe that's a place to at least find some common ground in 2015 on this topic. Right. Well, I say that the topic is, it, it's been a 50-50 topic and probably one of the most polarizing topics of our time. But more and more, people are waking up to the fact that, yes, these are babies, these are lives, these are the unborn. And when you look back on the, uh, on the, the collective number of millions of these babies that have been aborted, I mean, I, I think that there's a certain amount of resentment that sets into the people's minds. And I believe that this country is moving more toward a, a pro-life position uh, because of the things that we're learning today. Does it concern you at all that when you head down these roads, and we're on the line with Dr. Uh, excuse me, not Dr. Senator Phil, I gave you a promotion there for a moment. Senator Phil Pavlov. Yeah, don't deserve that. From St. Clair. But it doesn't concern you at all, Senator, that some of these uh, laws that you may be able to get through will get shot down in court or attacked in court or used as political fodder by the other side? Well, it will. And, you know, we've come to expect it in this movement. But that doesn't mean that we're any less passionate about driving home the fact that uh, the taking of unborn babies in Michigan uh, needs to be against the law, and we need to be able to do everything to protect it. This has been a battle over decades, essentially, and uh, it's not going to go away with this bill. All we're going to do is continue to drive home the fact and raise the awareness that, that these are babies. They don't, uh, they don't deserve to fall to the hands of an abortionist that is selectively harvesting organs while still in the mother's womb. It, it, it's, it's horrifying. And the more that we, uh, the more that we work to protect it, the more work that we have to protect it. Well, and I and I and I think that um, I think you're right about that. It takes a lot of hard work sometimes to do the right thing. Senator Phil Pavlov, I appreciate you stopping in today and discussing this. And if you could keep us up to date on the on those uh, bills, that legislation, and how things are progressing. I will, Stephen. Thanks to all of the pro-life people out there that are continually advocating for political pressure on this. Those are our grassroots, and that's where this battle is really going to be won by the people that are out there supporting this cause and giving the legislature um, the opportunity to, to vote on these kind of measures. So thanks to all those people out there fighting for life.